I do want to say that, uh, so last night, you know, we finished on the mission statement. And uh, so there's confusion and clarity both. And uh, it made us think harder about how we can uh, present that more clearly in the future too. So that was actually very helpful to us. So we're thinking through some ways to, to even make that easier uh, for people to to find how to build a vision, a mission statement. And so that'll be uh, one improvement that we can, we can make. Are we ready? No? All right. Well, go to uh, the third slide on the vision page, just get started. And you see the chart again about the, the, core, <clears throat> the core of the conception phase uh, in church planting. And we finished the mission part. Uh, we finished the core values part. We finished the targeting group part. And now we're at the vision part, okay? So that's where we are. But I wanna start off and talk about a few <clears throat> related things and sort of bring it together. The next slide is the review slide, if you see that on, in your manual. So the first one <clears throat> is why are we here? That's the question of mission. Why are we here? Uh, specifically, why are we here, your particular church plant? Then who are we? That's the value question. Um, what, what is important to us? What's our organizational culture as a church? Um, who are our target people? And now we're talking about what's our vision? What's our dream? What do we want? If God were to bless our, our, the things, the ministry, ministry he's put on our heart, what's our ministry going to look like in the future? So um, I want to pause here and tell a couple, a couple stories. Um, there's one's long. But um, the first one is, is that uh, I've been on staff at four different churches in my ministry career to this point. And the first church I was at, I was an intern. The second church I was at, I was an associate. The third church pastor, I was the lead pastor for the longest time. And then I also did an interim role at a church that was waiting on a pastor and had to do very different things in each of these churches. The first church I was a part of regarding vision, so regarding whether or not they had a vision for the future, they had a, they had a very clear understanding of where they were going. The first church I served, um, they had a pretty clear vision. It wasn't crystal clear, but it was clear enough uh, for them. Um, the second church I was in, as an associate pastor, um, was an opaque vision. I mean, it was like muddy water, okay? They didn't have clarity of vision, and they liked it that way, okay? So they just, it was a mess, and the church is still a mess, and they still ask me to help them, and it's just, they love their mess. So they have no vision, the church is dying, it's getting older, they have no idea what they're doing in the community, they're just busy, they got everybody's on a committee, for some reason it takes, you know, I don't know why, but for some reason in this church, they think it takes 100 people on committees to manage a church of 300 people. I have no idea why you need 100 managers over 300 people. That's ridiculous. So everyone thinks ministry is being on a committee. Well, being on a committee is not ministry. It's being on a committee. You don't really need that much policy, do you? Uh, and direction for, that's just resiliness. But they love it, so that's what they do. They just go to meetings all the time. They're in meetings. Every single night of the week, there are meetings to go to to vote on this, that, and the other thing. And that's what they think ministry is. And consequently, they're not doing anything uh, significant in reaching their community. And when people come into the church, uh, they have no idea uh, what this church is about. The third church that I led, of course, we had a super clear vision because I love vision. I'm so happy that I get to do the, the, this one and the next one on how you create vision in a, in a community, that's my favorite thing to do in ministry is to bring a bunch of people together and go in one direction. Um, so anyway, so we, we had a great time 12 years leading this church. We had a super clear vision and, uh, and it showed itself. Everybody knew what we were about. Everybody in the community knew what we were about and we were able to accomplish it because everybody was going in the same direction. And then um, the church that I was an interim at um, did not have a clear vision again. And so <clears throat> I had to help them think through that. And sort of an interesting story, I won't tell it here, but the clarity of vision process with them, and I, I really didn't work a lot with them, but just a little bit with the elders of the church, led them to close their church. And that was the clearest vision they've ever had. Okay? 
And that was the right thing to do because what they did is they gave up their property, uh, their control and everything to a local a multi-site church, and they became another location for a church that was very successful in reaching the lost in the community. And about a year later, I went back to meet with the elders who had made that decision to kill their own church and become part of another one, and they were still so happy that they made that decision because they felt now like they were a church that was effective in the community even though they lost their identity. But now they had a clear purpose, and they were so happy to be a part of that. So it was just very interesting. Um, so the clarity of vision led them to kill their church, but they could have just kept holding on to it for some nebulous concept that they're going to be effective. So anyway, enough of that. But <clears throat> I want to talk about values a minute. So I, was, I told you I was going to tell you about how we did core values at our church. So I actually printed off a copy. So this, this is like a, you know, a copy of what our core values. This would be like a, a bifold brochure type of thing. And, you know, and people had them. And so we have six core values at the Lancaster Free Church that I pastored. And so what we did is we listed them out, and then we had descriptions of what they were. So <clears throat> I want to talk about this a little bit. So these were our six core values. Trinitarian worship, adventurous faith, investing outside ourselves, earnest discipleship, genuine community, and satisfying theology. Satisfying theology. So those were our core values. I could talk about any of them for a long time. But the way we did our core values, actually, Steve, you may not like this, but <clears throat> I purposefully did not write them down for six years when I came to this replant situation because we created the culture first that we wanted, that I wanted at the church and the leadership, and we would talk about these things. We just never put them in writing. And so we started getting people to change and adopt these values and work them out and live them out. And we would talk about it as if a document existed somewhere, but it didn't. And then when we finally decided, hey, you know what? We should probably write those down because Steve Elliott's going to come and visit our church and preach for me. So we better have some core values to show him. So, so we said, okay, let's write them down. So I wrote them down, handed them out to the leadership, and I said, what do you think? He says, yeah, that's exactly who we are. And I passed them out to the congregation, and they're like, yeah, that's who we are. And it was just like overnight, total consensus on that, because we had already created the culture that we were looking for. And so, um, so I'll just give you an example. <clears throat> so under Adventurous Faith, the way we described it is we have two paragraphs of commitments. And so under Adventurous Faith, we said we are committed this is a value, right? A core value, a unique value for us. We are committed to being a missional church that takes great risks without fear of failure for the advancement of the fame of Jesus Christ. We seek to develop emerging leaders in our church body and to cultivate and resource their God-given ideas. At Lancaster EV Free, we believe that life and ministry are meant to be experienced as a faith adventure with God. We are committed to being a missionary people, strategic in establishing healthy, reproducing churches in North America and most especially among those who have never heard the gospel. Remember my Bible verse, Romans 15, 21? These people are our highest evangelistic priority. We are intentional in getting this done. We thrive upon the vision of the glory of God among all peoples and their full enjoyment of him. So that's how we would talk about this faith value or this value, this core value of an adventurous faith. So if you join our church, you're going to be joining this adventure. That's who we are. That's our culture. That's how we do things. That's how we talk. That's how we think. Those are the things we believe and that we hold dear Everyone in our church does. When it comes to investing outside ourselves, this is one Steve alluded to last night. We said this, in contrast to our culture of church in our area, we said this, we are committed to providing the vital basic ministries of our church life together, but we will invest most of our ministry resources, energy, 
and people in outreach to the world. As a church, we want to experience how much more blessed it is to give than to receive. Our focus is outward with a long-term perspective for what God might do through us. We are committed to evangelical ecumenism. That is fellowship and ministry partnership with evangelicals from various perspectives. Viewing collaboration as stimulating and productive, we endeavor together to creatively engage and transform the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our congregation affirms each member's God-given calling for the furtherance of his glory throughout society and culture. So there's a lot in there, but in contrast to every other church around us, we are not going to multiply programs. We will not do it. So when people come to me and say, like I mentioned the other night, oh, I think that we should have this program because all the other churches in our community have the program. I say, well, then why do we need it? Go to their programs for those things if you want those. That's not who we are because we're not interested in a cruise ship church where people come to be comforted. There's plenty of those churches around. Go lay down on the sofa, have a great life, okay? But if you're going to join our church, you're on a mission. And part of that means we're going to start sacrificing as a body of Christ. We are not going to multiply programs to meet our own needs. We're going to go see what the needs are out there, and we're going to go meet those needs. And you know what? It's going to cost you a lot of money and time. But you're going to be blessed because Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And we're going to experience that together. And so that's that value. And it becomes ingrained in our people. They've been living it for a while. So when we write it up, it's like, yeah, that's who we are. And they love it. Earnest discipleship. I won't read them all, but this is the last one. We are committed to develop fully as genuine and earnest disciples of Jesus Christ, living just as he taught us, determined to grow up in the fullness of Christ and be worthy of our high calling, we graciously encourage one another to excel still more in our spiritual disciplines and in our disciple-making. We are committed to give up our lives and resources, and we have resolved up front that this will mean great sacrifice and suffering as we fulfill our calling, but also the greatest of joys. As a church family, we uphold and encourage one another to persevere in grace for the glory of Christ in his church. With a resilient faith, we share with one another the peace and hope of the kingdom of God. And so we're very committed to discipleship at our church, serious discipleship. We wanted to use the word earnest. It's earnest disciple making is a part of our church. So we're a serious church, and we would often talk about how we have a serious joy in our church. We're not serious, somber. It's a very exciting and joyful place to be. But discipleship is serious. You want to grow in Christ? Well, then you should go to Lancaster EV Free because they're committed to earnest discipleship. And so there are a lot of these, you know, in Genuine Community, we talk a lot about diversity in our church and why that's a value and how we're going to value it and what our attitudes are going to be and how we're going to resolve conflict and how we are not going to ignore conflict. Those types of things. So we took our values and then we fleshed them out with behaviors and practices and these types of things so that people could understand the values. Now, at the same time, one of my four, he wasn't an elder at this time. He wasn't serving in this role. His name is Joe. He's a really good friend of mine. He was actually on the search team and the chairman who brought me to the church. But um, after we actually put the core values in writing and we we made it much more formal. This is who we are as a church. We defined ourselves. I mean, we have a mission. The vision I'll share with you in a little bit. We have a vision too. But those values, that culture, as soon as we put this out, Joe and his wife Susan, dear people, uh, they came to see me in my office one day and they just said, um, you know, I'm so thankful they came to me rather than just leaving the church. But they said, we don't feel like we fit here. And I said, why not? I said, because when you wrote down the the core values of the church, we read those values, and those values are not us. And so, you know, Joe's been a friend of mine at this point for like, you know, six years, so it's great. We've been in all sorts of experiences together. And just talk to him about how, you know, that's that's good. And uh, so what, how would you describe your values? And we talked through that, and we talked about how values are unique to each church. 
And as they, I said, if you describe to me the kind of church you're looking for, you know, I'm friends with all the pastors in the whole community. You know, we have a lot of evangelical churches in our, in our valley, <clears throat> a big valley. It's about 300,000 people. Um, and so they did. And I said, okay, you guys might want to check out these three churches because I think they'll be really good fit for where you are in your faith right now, where you are in your family right now. You know, we all go through different seasons in life and need different things. But you know what? We're all, all the churches, all the evangelical churches, we're all on the same team. Okay, somebody said it earlier, I think it was Steve, maybe it was June, says, we're not competing with the churches around us. Oh, it was June. And we're not copying the churches around us. Okay, we have a unique calling, and we're going to fulfill it. And there's a place for everybody, but it might not be at our church, and that's okay. And so this, this really helped us um, move ahead and keep moving ahead when we articulated our values. It's extremely important uh, to understand what kind of culture, I like that word um, a lot, is that what kind of culture do we want to create in our community? And that's values and practices and these other types of things. So anyway, I don't know, any questions about that experience? I might have left out vital details, but just what we did at that ch our church on that. So hopefully that makes values a little bit more um, tangible for you. Um, they're wonderful things. Daniel, yes? The big difference here is that you don't have anywhere else to send the people. Yeah. So, so they can conform. Yeah. So it either creates a conflict and an ongoing conflict. Yep. There is well, if you multiply churches. Yeah, you can multiply churches of different different value sets. But the other thing too is I was having a conversation, you know, in our meeting last night that we had, um, too, with um no, I forgot your name, sorry. Yeah, we're fine. What's your name? Yano. 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 We were talking a lot about this topic. And just talking about um the fact, and we'll get to this a little bit later, I think, in this vision conversation as well, especially as, yeah, especially as I talk about it. When I talk about vision as a group, we'll get to it more and more specifically. But um, God didn't make those people leaders of the church. I'll speak very frankly. If they're not the leaders of the church, they have no business trying to lead the church. That's insubordination to God. Okay? God has given his leaders to the church and gifted them to lead his church. So you can work with people pastorally, but ultimately the leadership team of the church is responsible for setting that vision and setting those values. And you can determine how inclusive you want to be and help people find their fit. But ultimately, you have to determine what the direction of the church is going to be. And people need to understand that. Like I would have a saying, sometimes I would have ornery people in my church too. Well, we have plenty of them. But I deal with them each differently depending on who they are. You know, you know how to do that as a pastor. But some people, I just had to be frank with them and say, you know what? When you have your own church, you can do it that way. But right now, I'm the pastor of this church. God made me the pastor of this church. These leaders in this church, they had me come in to be the pastor of this church. The people voted, right, in our congregation. It's a 98% vote. So I'm the pastor of this church. I'm the captain of the ship, right? And this is the direction we're going to go. We'd love to have you be a part of our mission. These are some great places I see that you can serve. Um, but no, you're not allowed to try to take over the ship and steer it in another direction. And if you consistently do that, we will discipline you. So those types of things have come up in our past. And often when I've confronted people like that, they're like, oh, okay, that may, actually makes a lot of sense. And then they find their place and they realize that there's a lot more peace um, and success if they just submit to the vision and the leaders that God has given him, given them. So, I mean, Hebrews 13 is pretty clear that you're to submit to your spiritual leaders. So, anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, but you're going to have to solve it. But, yep. And you want me to comment more? Okay. So, I had a lot of those people and a lot of those conversations and... Anyway, so more, more of that will come up, though, when you're trying to create vision and bring everybody on board, because I don't want to lose people, right? You don't want to like, oh, well, you don't fit, so bye. You know, you don't want to do that, right? You want to see if you can convince people to really come with you. But at some point, you know, you can't have eternal conflict. That's not healthy. It's not biblical. Okay, it's sinful to not respect your spiritual leaders, right? That's what the Bible says. So... Sometimes you need to help people respect you. I mean, Paul said that to Timothy. Don't let them look down on your youthfulness, right? Okay, so there are plenty of those types of exhortations in the text of, of Scripture. 
So anyway, um, <clears throat> that's sort of negative though. So uh, let's let's move on to uh, to some other things here, and then we'll how much time we got? Oh, we got to take our break soon. Well, let's do this first. Okay, so we'll do the dream exercise. It's a good one to go to lunch to because then you can continue the conversation. So as you think about the church you're going to plant, what do you see? Right, a leader sees the future. Right, he doesn't look at the present. In fact, it's really hard for him to see the present. He can only see what's in the future. That's how he lives his life, okay? So I'd like you to be in your teams or, in your, or whoever is working on planting your ideal church with you or your imaginary church. And um, I just want you to talk for, um, talk for a couple minutes about what you see, what you want your church to be, okay? Just describe it. All right, well, let's come back together. And uh, I want to hear a couple visions, okay? I know you're excited about sharing your visions, but uh, you can do more of that over lunch. Okay, so who wants to tell me what they see? So we got like one, two, three, four, five, six. We don't need to hear from seven different groups, it looks like. I just want to hear from two or three of you, maybe. What do you see in the future? What, what's your church look like down the road? Who wants to share first? You don't know what you see? Okay. So it's really hard for slowness. Hard to dream? Yeah, because we've always been under someone who has told us what to do and do okay. something on your own. So yeah. yeah, this is very different then. So, mm-hmm. so dreaming is something which is totally you know. Okay. That's helpful cultural insight. Thank you. Anybody dare to dream? We can. Um, Good. Okay. Mm-hmm. Very good. Very good. That's a very clear, compelling vision of the future. That's what a vision is. When do you want to become the senior pastor? <laughs> That's a topic for another day. So, yes, but we're going to break for lunch here in a minute. But so let me let me tell you let me just tell you a story of a friend of mine. Okay? His name is David and um He's a, he, uh, oh, about 10 years ago, I would say, uh, a friend of mine, young pastor, never pastored a church, okay? He did his training and all those types of things. He researched the most ethnically diverse community in the United States, and it is in East Nashville, Tennessee, okay? Because in East Nashville, Tennessee, there are a bunch of groups, Christian and, and governmental and nonprofits, that are resettling refugees from around the world in enormous apartment complexes and buildings, okay? So I went out to visit him, and uh, and this is when he was just getting started. Barely had support. He was going around trying to get support. I was helping him a little bit, think through some of that. And so uh, he said, well, let me just take you on a drive. And I said, okay, where are we going? He says, I want to show you some stuff. So we just started driving through these apartment complexes. And he says, you know what I see? I said, what, David? He said, see that building there? I see a church there. That building, I see an Ethiopian church. That building, I see a Burmese church. That building, and he went on and on and on with all the ethnic groups 
that were there. And he'd already started doing work, okay? And so as we're driving through the parking lot of these communities, we get stopped by mobs of people just coming out to say hi to David because David had been going through and just meeting people and starting all the preparatory work uh, for church planting. But in his mind, he already saw this community. If this complex had 50 buildings, he saw 50 churches. It'll be a church in every single building, and it will be based on these groups of people. So that's a kind of, uh, I always think of David, I'm still in contact with him, but just uh, how you can see what other people don't see. Um, so, and I think your example was really good too. So, um, and I'm sure there are others. Let's break for lunch and we'll come back and we'll continue um, our vision discussion after that. So.